Robert Berger has a relaxed, sincere manner, and I felt quite comfortable sitting with him in his home in Rosemont, New Jersey. We discussed his great love for illustration and fine art. Robert has won many awards for his modern, surreal, brilliantly colored images created with an airbrush. He designs a variety of products, clocks, lamps, book covers, record albums, and advertising. We'll begin this segment by watching Robert in the creation of an airbrush painting in his home studio. Okay, here we are in my studio, and what I'll do now is explain how I go about creating a job for um, a magazine. Now, initially what I do is do my drawings on tracing paper, and once those are refined to the point that I'm satisfied with them, I'll transfer them onto my illustration board. So I'll tape, tape down my drawing, and then coat the back of the tracing paper with a pencil, just scribble on the back and smooth it out with a paper towel, and then just trace over it and transfer it onto the illustration board. Okay, once I have my drawing on my illustration board, then I'm ready to start airbrushing. And in order to uh, start the airbrushing, I have to cut stencils. For each different color area, I cut a stencil out. So I use tracing paper and rubber cement to create my stencils. Cutting the stencils is probably the uh, slowest part of the process. The actual airbrushing goes a lot faster. It's cutting the stencils that's the uh, most cons time consuming aspect of it. All right, now the stencil's all cut out, and I'm just going to peel it off the background. And I've already got my colors mixed up here. Use an eyedropper and uh, 35 millimeter film containers, and also this little palette. What I'm going to do is put in the background color, which will make like a sort of a sky blue color. Okay, you're going to start with, I've mixed two different color blues, and I'm going to start with my darker one, darkening things up at the top and fading it to a lighter color as we come down towards the bottom. One thing with airbrushing is to make sure the surface doesn't get too wet. And again, for expediency, instead of having to stand here and wait for the paint to dry, I use the blow dryer to make sure the paint dries up. Okay, now I'm coming back in with a lighter blue. One of the tricks behind airbrushing is uh, maintaining the airbrush in constant motion so you don't get a buildup of paint. What will happen is if the paint builds up too much, it'll start to run and puddle, and that's something you don't want to happen. Okay, I think the background's done. Uh, got a nice smooth transition of color. Okay, now that that's all done, I'll remove the tracing paper stencil. Now I'm just going to be repeating all these steps uh, for each color area. For each color area, I have to cut a stencil. And uh, depending on how many colors are in a particular piece, or how complicated the piece is, means cutting more and more stencils. So, for each area, I've got to cut a new stencil.
Usually when I'm working, I have music playing like really loud. Then I don't hear all this stuff. <laughs> Masterpiece is complete. Got kind of a lonely guy who's hanging out in the void somewhere. <laughs> Robert, many of our viewers might not understand uh, the difference between graphic art, illustration, fine art. Could you address that for us? Well, I, um, a great division in, in between illustration and fine art. To me, it's all pretty much the same thing, but it just has different applications or um, ends up being seen in a different manner. Um, I guess most people would say, well, an illustrator goes from something. Somebody has said, here's a story. Mm -hmm. Take my words and illustrate it. Right. Where a fine artist goes from nothing. Um, but yours kind of intermix, don't they? I mean, sometimes you have done something that then later is used for an illustration. Yeah, that's true. Um, the thing is, the things that are considered a fine art are things that are considered illustration. I mean, um, if you look at Michelangelo's work mm -hmm. of the, in the Sistine Chapel, essentially it's illustrating the Bible, and he was commissioned right. by the Pope right. to illustrate the Bible on the walls. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is that illustration or is it fine art? You know, so I think there's a lot of uh, areas where it's a gray area. It's like, well, it could be one or it could be the other. Uh, there's definitely work I do which you would consider like strict illustration, like say I might be hired by an ad agency or a magazine to illustrate for a particular product or a particular story, where I'm pretty much being dictated to, um, where they've come up with a concept and a design that they're hiring me to execute. So in that way, that is a little bit more, I'd say, illustration, Directed, like a hired yes. hand. I'm a hired hand. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are illustration assignments I get where it might be, say, an album cover or a book cover, or even editorial work, where they'll just present me with either the manuscript or um, a, a vague title. idea of what they have in mind, and then it's really up to me to come up with concepts and design and present them with, you know, various sketches. And then I think it starts to cross over, you know. Um, then I think it, the line kind of blurs a little bit as to, is this commercial art or is it fine art? What is gouache? I've heard so much about it and I need it explained. Well, it's also called designer's color. Um, it's a water-based paint, and gouache is actually like a powdered substance which is suspended in a liquid. Because I'm a teacher and I work with a lot of creative children, were you considered a creative? I, I think so. I think what initially got me started was some of my earliest memories of when I was a little kid is that my father used to draw cartoons for us, um, like Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd and Daffy Duck. And to me, it was like magic. It was like, wow, Dad, show me how to do that. <laughs> you know. And I think that's what initially got me started. So I was always drawing from since when I was a little kid. Um, and I guess in, in grade school, I was always considered like the artistic kid, you know, in, in class. Are there some artists from the past that you really enjoyed looking at their work? One artist that I always really liked, who I think has had more of an influence on me recently, is um, Richard Lindner. Um, I've always really liked his work, and I think he's been almost a continuous influence on, on the things that I do. Um, another artist that I've really been looking at a, a lot again, who I've always liked, is Picasso. Um, his work to me is, there's just so much that he did, and there's so many directions that he pursued. Um, I find him like a constant source of inspiration. Um, there's another artist called um, Ed Poschke. I'm not sure if I have the last name pronounced properly, but he's an artist out of Chicago who was sort of, um, I guess, included in the Chicago Imagist School. Uh, his work I really uh, like a lot, and I think he's been somewhat of an influence on me also. I've heard a lot about an airbrush, but I don't understand what is an airbrush. I started using an airbrush when I first went to college. Um, I bought one and just started playing around with it. Um, actually, one of my painting teachers suggested that I buy one because I was painting with oils and trying to achieve very smooth effects, um, transitions of color from dark to light, and trying to make it sitting there blending, blending, blending with a brush. 
to get it to look very smooth. So he suggested, she said, what you're trying to do here with oils... It can't it, be done. Well, he said it'd be a lot easier to do if you bought an airbrush and use an airbrush to do it. So I bought an airbrush. I said, yeah, he was right, <laughs> you know, because there was something about that kind of effect, I guess, that I was drawn to. And ever since then, I mean, airbrushing has really been my main medium. Artbeat has a grant from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and I understand that you have a grant from the New Jersey Council of the Arts. But then what did you do with this grant? Well, I did a series of paintings um, of my own concepts, my own ideas, which are sort of uh, loosely based on the thought process or the way the mind works. And I don't know, kind of comment on, I guess, my state of mind. <laughs> and the general idea behind this piece was just kind of the things that concern you throughout your life or the things that um, we need to think about or that are important to us. And it kind of shows all of these elements in a symbolic manner kind of exploding out of somebody's head. Um, I don't know what more to say about that piece. Uh, what I like to do, you know, in a way, I don't really like describing what, in words, what a piece means. I feel like, well, here's the painting, and this is the title, and now it's up to you. I've done my share of the work, and now it's up to you to well, figure it out. Right. <laughs> I, I think most painters agree, mm, and it makes yeah. that circular motion between the viewer and the artwork. And if you dictate to me, I, w I couldn't get as much out of it. Perhaps mm -hmm. my background would have me read more into it. Right. I think it is interesting, though, for people sometimes to hear what an artist, if somebody was doing research on you, want to go back and, and, and know exactly what you what were thinking. What I was thinking at the time, And yeah. then compare it to what others have said about it or, you know, yeah. have gotten from it. Well, I think with all, all art is communication. And... That's what an artist is doing. He's trying to communicate something to another human being in a visual manner. Um, and I like art, and I think I try to do it in my own art, that has a certain ambiguity into it. That, um, that's another difference that maybe we could reflect back on between fine art and illustration. But I think there's ambiguity so that each person can bring their own experience to a painting and extract from it their own personal meaning. And I, I mean, I've had people look at my paintings and say, well, is this what it means? Is, you know, and trying to explain it, I says, yeah. <laughs> right, this next piece is called uh, Joe Infoglut. And again, this piece gets back to what I was saying before about combining things that are primitive with things that are modern. Um, the way this figure in the painting looks, it's, um, you could say it looks like a robot. At the same time, you could say, well, no, it looks more like a primitive mask, um, you know, like an African mask or um, an Indian, ancient Indian mask. Um, so it's kind of both. It kind of, there is an ambiguity there as to whether it's something modern or something ancient. And the idea of all these attachments to the head, I guess at the time, I might have just been feeling sort of overwhelmed um, by information. You know, it's like, well, you yeah, have a stack of like 20 books here I want to read, and the newspapers and magazines are piling up, and there's all these movies I want to see, and these uh, um, music I want to hear. And I think in our society today, you're just like overwhelmed with information, and you have to like sort through it and find out what is important to you and what's not. So I think that's kind of the idea that goes behind that piece. Uh, this piece is entitled Artificial Intelligence. And by calling it that, I, I think what I was getting at was a sort of a play on what those two words me mean together. Um, you can interpret it as artif something being intelligent, but artificially created, as in like a computer type um, intelligence. Or again, I think you can interpret that as meaning something else, like intelligence that really isn't intelligence. It's like fake intelligence or you know, or you know stupidity <laughs> so this piece is another piece that I had initially done for myself um, the title of this is the semi-civilized man and again it relates back to what I was saying before about combining um, primitive ideas with very modern ideas and sort of the this idea just somehow popped into my head I don't know where it came from but um, 
the idea of a figure with a primitive mask on in a business suit. That's and a beautiful it, concept. Yeah, <laughs> and it says something about people, where we've come from and where we are now. Um, of course, we consider our civilization to be so advanced uh, and we're just so civilized, but at times uh, we really are very primitive underneath it all. There's, there's still there's these instincts and things within us that come out um, at times that, sh that show that. Rob lives in a passive solar house which he helped design and build. It uses the common sense principles of a southern exposure with an expanse of windows, the use of a wood stove, living spaces around a stair column, and the use of blinds and ceiling fans. What do you see in the future for yourself and for your art? What direction will you be going? Well, uh, ideally I'd like to be able to pursue my personal work and be able to sell that work and um, earn a living that way. Um, but uh, I enjoy what I'm doing. I really um, am glad that I can earn a living doing what I love to do, which is paint and draw. Vincent Seglia has lived for 30 years in an old farmhouse in Bucks County at Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. He is a teacher, draftsman, colorist, constructivist, and consummate artist. Zoltan Buki, who was curator of fine arts for the New Jersey State Museum in 1986, wrote this about Vincent as an introduction to a retrospective of his work. Vincent Seglia is in love with nature. Even a cursory examination of his work reveals the awe and excitement the artist experiences with every sunrise. For those of us who take our time to savor Seglia's paintings, there is an opportunity to identify with the artist's feelings and to reacquaint ourselves with the world. Seglia does not hold up a mirror to record what has already been registered on the retina. In his work, we are presented at one time with grand vistas and at other times with microscopic glimpses which the artist has already transformed by his passion. The exploration of even the most minute aspect of nature offers him another occasion for visual discovery and for us another feast for the eye and the mind. The artist is not against man and his doings, but in his world man and nature live in harmony. Vincent Seglia is an old-fashioned artist. He goes nowhere without paper and whatever marker. His eyes never tire of seeing. His mind never tires of understanding. His heart never tires of feeling. He makes notes, entries in his visual diary. He lets his notes rest there. Their memory ferments in his mind, and he calls them forth at the command of his inner needs. Looking at his paintings, we rejoice with him as we discover ourselves Vincent Seglia is in love with life. Tell us about where you go in Italy and how you started doing this. Well, we started to go to Italy uh, because I was doing workshops on my own. I tried to do workshops through, the, through Mercer County College, but it didn't work too well, so we decided to do it on our own, Corinne and I. And we did this for about uh, 13 years and uh, we take American students over to Italy. Uh, the workshops were three weeks each, and uh, we do two a summer. Mm, most of the work that I'm doing in the last, uh, I'd say, uh, six years, seven years, have been done in Italy, and uh, inspired by the ambiance there, inspired by the experiences of, that I've had there. And so it comes off very well. I mean, I, I come here, I come back in late October, November, and, and seem to have a little problem getting started here. Uh, there's something about the, I guess, the way we Americans live. Mm -hmm. You know, life here is very hurried, very hurried and uh, whereas there it's very laid back and very uh, old, it's very ancient. I mean, you have the ancient with the modern there, you know, which is very fascinating. The village we live in goes back to the Romans, and there are possibly 400 uh, permanent residents there. So everybody gets to know you as the 
Pittori, they call you. Pittori is a painter. Uh, they call you professore. Mm -hmm. And the titles in Italy are very, very widely used. <laughs> you and know. So you felt very grand there. <laughs> well, you feel very good there. I mean, artists, uh, I think, uh, go there because you do feel good. And uh, because uh, art is in their culture. I mean, it's for nature. I mean, 3,000 years of art. And, uh, uh, you know, anybody who's been there to Florence or Rome or. Uh, you know, it's all over, so that uh, the people uh, take it for granted that, uh, you know, you... And that uh, you're serious. Uh, you're serious, mm -hmm. yeah, because it's a small country, about as big as Arizona, so that you don't have the, 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 the wealth like we have here, and we don't... Uh, uh, you know, here everybody paints almost. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right. Everybody's in an art group. Everybody's taking lessons. Everybody's going to workshops. And it's, it's like a real big, uh, big business. Well, there you don't have that. Uh, it's not, th not that way at all. Uh, painting right. is a serious yeah. business. Mm -hmm. It's something serious. You have to study for it. You have to have, uh, uh, you know, you have to produce. And they don't bother you. They, they, they respect you. And, and uh, doors open up, whereas they, here it's difficult to have doors open up to you. But there it's, it's a lot easier. Are you primarily a landscape painter? I think primarily, yes. Recent. I think primarily, yes, but I've, Done all, you know, I've done other subject matter because in teaching you have to, you have to have uh, a versatility, you know. And I think uh, most subjects uh, inspire me. I didn't show you any figure work, uh, real figure work. We have the very abstract. Uh, one yeah, that. Here. But I have other work which I would be would take time to show. Mm -hmm. Also, still life. I once in a while get into a nice, beautiful bouquet of somebody brings me flowers. I, I just love to sit down and just paint them right away. It's an exciting thing. Now, yeah. art has been a large part of your life, hasn't it? Yes, it has been uh, ever since I was a little, little boy. I uh, started, for, uh, funny enough, uh, with watercolor, which is a difficult medium. But in those days, when I was uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, they used to sell little watercolor sets mm -hmm. in cakes. Remember the mm -hmm. cake color? And you can buy them very cheaply with a very bad brush you know, very cheaply, and uh, go off into your room and, and, and paint. And that's how I got started with watercolor. Um, and found it fascinating and uh, just uh, kept at it. Um, you never know really what turns you on. Um, I think all of us have something uh, inside of us that we really want to do, you know, something really deep inside that, uh, that uh, we have to get out. We have to get to it someday. So this is your communication to us, to all of us. Well, uh, if you want to put it that way, I think it's just something you have to do. It's like an obsession, like a, it's an obsession is what it is, because I think communicating, of course, is, is, is great too. It's, it comes out of that. But the fact is that you have to express yourself with, with you know, with paint or whatever is very important to, to, to uh, any artist. Uh, of course, it then communicates. If it's good, it, it should mm -hmm. communicate. And it should be provocative. Huh? It should be uh, interesting. So that painting that went to Moscow uh, was done on the lake, which is a, you know, note the color on that. The color is a uh, kind of a blue, bluish kind of color feel. Uh, that was a very, uh, uh, the change in the weather on the lake is rapid, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll get a very sunny uh, hour or two, and then a squall will come up. So you get this change in the atmosphere, which is really fantastic. Uh, and the other, acrylic. This is an acrylic, yeah. And of course, there's collage into this, into this painting, mm -hmm. too. The Giovansano paintings, of course, were done up in the mountains above Como, and the color there is a lot warmer, as you notice in the painting very hot and bright, and it was a hot summer day, and I think all that, I experience all that. I think it's, uh, emotionally, I think, uh, I feel that in the painting, very much so. I think a painting has to have an emotional appeal, you know, to be a good painting. I think it has to have some emotional factor, and, and I think color to me is very important. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but then you leave the color behind and do the series with just black and white, the ink. Yeah, well, that is, uh, that's kind of a, uh, a diversion. That's kind of a, a relief from painting for me. I always loved to sketch. I always loved to draw. 
love drawing, sketching. And I think drawing is the basis of painting, and uh, I try to tell students that all the time. I don't, uh, I don't lay in a drawing. I don't lay it out. I don't, I just go right into it, spontaneous thing. I, I love the quality that you get. Sure, you ruin some, throw them out, start again. But you get that spontaneity of, of line that's really very exciting, you know, mm -hmm. very, very exciting. Plus the emotional fact of the, of the experience. I mean, you, you have an experience with, with a piece of nature, you know, as you're sketching. There it is, laid out in front of you. And the idea is that, for me, the relationship with that experience, which is smell and color and the sound and light and uh, the shapes, and that's what really uh, I think is important for me. <laughs> Last year in Italy, in sep late September, for some reason I got onto these very big, very big drawings. I don't know how it happened, but it just happened. You know, things things happen in your mind. You come up with ideas, and and I started doing these big drawings, and I got so excited every day working on them. I brought some back home. And then during the winter I was working on, I've got batches of them. You haven't seen half of them. <laughs> and they so all I, are the black Well, they're and all white. different. They're all different. What you saw today is one series with the figure sitting or, you know, but then I have others up, you know. And uh, so for me, it's very exciting because you, I, and you know, the, the, uh, yeah, and the figure has been done for centuries. You know, the figure is a figure. You know, we all have seen the figure done. and. Uh, so you try to try to find another way of of using the figure in a composition. It doesn't have to be a drawing; it could well, be a painting. Right? I notice you, know. you keep turning. You yeah. Turn your work as you want. Yeah, I do that with my paintings too. The way I check my uh, space relationship and my composition is I it has to work on all four sides. If it doesn't work for me on all four sides, the composition there's something wrong with it. Something that I feel is not right. So I keep turning it. I look at it vertically. I check the space there, check the forms and space, turn it again, then again. Uh, so it has to work. Oh, yeah, it has to work in all four directions. We should take a good painting uh, in a museum or anywhere in a book and just, just try that. I noticed that you're doing more assemblages. Now, you've done assemblages throughout your career, haven't you? Yeah, I, I started doing them back in the uh, mid 50s, uh, 60s. Uh, when I moved to this farm and uh, found all this beautiful throwaways, by throwaways, other yeah, I mean <laughs> junk, which is textured and w weathered because the farm is old, 1740, and so stuff gets weathered, beautifully weathered, and color changes and textures and so on. I piled it all up in the studio there, and thinking I would like to do something with it someday, and that's the way it, it evolved, you know. I know that this might be a sensitive question, but that your eyesight has been getting worse. What are you going to do about this in your career? Listen. Well, I just uh, just go. I just uh, I just keep going. You know, like we say in we say in Italian, uh, "Guardiamo sempre avanti," which means let's look always ahead. And this is all I do. I just keep looking ahead, and try to keep a positive attitude.